So Luke 12, 22 to 34. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat, nor about your body, what you'll put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than birds? Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you're not able to do a smaller thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, who you have little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried, for all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you have need of them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in the heavens that will not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So please be seated. The readings today are all about remembering, about thinking about where we are and about looking forward. I was sort of wondering how this has any kind of analogy to, to life now because the, the time that Jesus was talking to, I mean the, the lands he lived in were chiefly what you might call a rural economy where people basically grew their food and had a, a minor kind of cash economy. They sort of sold a little bit of surplus for the extras which they didn't make themselves. And therefore, most of what he talked about, he, he was talking to people, generally speaking, about things they understood, about things that were part of their life. So he often talked about sowing and reaping and sheep and goats and all that kind of thing, because that's what people knew, that's what they understood. Well, we don't actually do that much now <laughs> in our country. Not many of us actually sow a field with wheat. Has anyone here actually ever done that? No? I've never ever actually sown wheat or barley or anything like that. I've sown grass seed, um, I'm not sure that really is quite the same, and therefore, well, he wasn't really talking to people with a cash economy, and the odd occasions he did refer to it were things like taxes and coins, which we can relate to, but not usually in very complimentary terms. Anyway, it's clear though he wants us to think about these things, and there's a, a kind of... Um, the way scripture looks at these things, it's always about remembering and about looking forward. The, um, in the Old Testament, they, the, the Israelites had these, these festivals. There was the Feast of Weeks, as they called it, or Feast of Pentecost, as we now more familiarly call it. And there's the Feast of Succoth, Feast of Booths, Feast of Tabernacles, it's sometimes called. And both of those were harvest festivals. The first one was the, the grain harvest, which for the Israelites in, in Israel happened in early summer, in about June. And the next one was what they called the great ingathering. Basically it was the rest, everything on top of the grain harvest. So it was the figs, the, um, the grapes, the pomegranates, the dates, sorry? Figs. Figs, yes. And basically everything else. Everything else. And both of those fe feasts had their <coughs> like, sense of thanksgiving for provision. And we're plainly ex you know, enjoined in scripture to thank God for his provision. I mean, if you think about everything that we have, everything that we, we own, everything that we do, is made possible by something else. You know, none of us are completely autonomous, are we? You know, if you think about your, your job, someone educated you, someone clothed you when you were tiny. Somehow you were, you walked into your whatever work you might do. You didn't make the office furniture. You know, you didn't build the building in which it is. 
You didn't write the software on the computers. Some of you might have done that, but then you didn't do the furniture. <laughs> but the fact is that we walk into these things which are completely interrelated to everyone else. And if you follow back the cause and the effect of all these things, you know, no one can claim the credit for everything at any time. Everything we do is completely enmeshed with what everyone else does. And we can only do that because we live in the world we live in. Because everything around us is part of the world. I mean, it might sound as if I'm kind of stating the obvious, but God wants us to think about these things. And he made the world. You know, he, he made everything. And he wants us to take to heart the fact he made everything and we are completely part of what he has made. One of the, the kind of fallacies, one of the, the, the errors of thought that have come out in, in the years, you know, the last couple of centuries really, is that somehow we live apart from nature. You know, somehow we're separate from nature. And we kind of look at nature as something apart from ourselves. But one thing that the ecological movement has brought to our attention is the fact we live very much as part of nature. You know, we are simply part of the environment in which we live. So it may not be immediately obvious why we should count insects in the river us, but we're actually part of this land in which we live. And if the insects in the usk are all dying, it's because the river is polluted, which means basically the place where we live is polluted, which broadly speaking is bad for us. You know, we can't simply separate ourselves off from the world in which we live. And when people attempt to, or they forget this, you get these awful environmental pollution issues. You know, you get these terrible clouds of dust in China where everyone chokes on dust for days and end, or terrible smogs in cities. You get water pollution where people are poisoned by their water. You know, and so all the laws which have about the environment basically are to stop us poisoning ourselves. You know, without them, we probably would. One of the great joys of communism was that they didn't have these laws. And they have environmental catastrophes we could scarcely imagine because of the lack of you know, foresight and the lack of accountability in these things. You, know, you only need a sort of status mentality where someone's in charge and simply lays it all out. And then you realise that no one actually knows everything about anything. <laughs> so someone lays down the law in some grand way, then it's going to be catastrophic because they won't know everything and it's going to go horribly wrong. And you know, all over Eastern Europe and Soviet Russia we saw it happen monstrously. And so we need to be constantly monitoring these things. We're part of this, this world in which we live. You know, the vision in Genesis is that we live in a garden. God put Adam and Eve in the garden to work it and to keep it, it says. So we mustn't therefore despise our, our place in nature either. Because there's another thing which has come out of the environmental thing now, that somehow human beings by their very nature are evil. Well, we are evil. But we are, if you like, entitled to be here as well. You know, we can actually make the environment nice. You know, gardens can be really lovely. You know, the idea of actually keeping a garden and looking after it is, is a wholesome thing. And we human beings can make the world into our garden. We can do beautiful things. We can do wonderful things. We can actually improve the environment if we set our minds to it. We can make it more fruitful, more diverse in, in, in its ecology. We can make it more beautiful using the things which are naturally there and then somehow adding to them in a way that is wonderful when it's at its best. We can do both. We can destroy it, we can kill it, and we can bless it. But we're very much part of it. And that is the, the message of Scripture. But we also have our preoccupations. We forget where we've come from, and we're anxious about where we're going. And in these readings today, we're cautioned about both those errors. The Israelites are reminded, for your Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of bricks and water. This is following the famous passage where God says to um, Moses, For man does not live by bread alone, but by all that proceeds from my mouth. And that was the very phrase that was quoted by Jesus when he was tempted by Satan to turn the stones into bread in the desert. 
And you'll find there the way that the Israelites were called to remember that they were fed in the desert. They were fed the manna which they did not know in order to teach them. And this was remembered at their harvest festival of Pentecost. You did not eat bread in the desert, you ate manna. And the manna taught you that you do not live by bread alone. Do not forget this, this passage says. Don't forget where you have come from. Don't forget how you got here. Don't forget who is your provider. Because if you do, it says at the end, you will perish. <coughs> There's this lovely Hebrew idiom where you repeat a verb. You say it the first time in a, a participle form, it's known as the infinitive absolute, and the second time as the active form of the verb. So to roughly put it into English, you'd say, perishing you shall perish. And it's where we get where we get the word Abaddon from, meaning destruction. So he puts it in very strong terms. I think the, the way they've translated there is somewhat diffident. You, know, you might go, you, know, you might perish. But in Hebrew, it's really, you will die. You know, take to heart. If you forget these things, you will perish, it says. And you might say that about the environment. If you forget that you live as part of nature, you will die because you'll destroy it and, you'll, and then you'll kill yourselves. <laughs> but there's a bigger metaphysical message here as well. Don't forget where you've come from. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget who provides for you. And the way that these metaphysical and these moral and spiritual meanings are wound together with physical things is repeated in Corinthians. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He's, on one level, he's simply talking about agriculture. You know, if you don't put out much seed, you're not going to get much harvest. Nick is going to do this now with the kids. If they don't plant many bulbs, they're not going to get many flowers next year. So, obvious cause and effect. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Straightforward, you know, statement. But Paul's not just talking about harvest, about agriculture. He's talking about their lives. He's saying as a general principle in your life, if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. And when um, we did this kind of youth alpha thing with the, with the teenagers a few years ago, when my children were small, I and the, the ladies who were doing it together decided we were not going to sow sparingly. We're going to sow generously in this. In other words, we were going to do this wholeheartedly. We're going to do this as, if you like, well as we possibly could. And the way that Youth Alpha was organised was you needed clips from little films to illustrate the points we're trying to make. So me and Sean bought every single film on DVD that was referred to in the whole series. We just got every single one. Every time they said, this is a good idea, we'd get it. We'd say, yeah, we're going to do it. So if you like, it was abundant. <laughs> they said, show one or two of these things to make the point. We'd show all of them to make the point. And then when it says, you know, give them something to eat, we'd give them loads of stuff to eat, and we'd make sure it was nice food. You know, we didn't give them junk, we didn't give them cheapo stuff, we gave them nice, wholesome food, and we gave them plenty of it. So they ate and they were satisfied. But I think that that spirit, if you like, that way of thinking about it was blessed, because it really worked well. And Jordan Peterson makes the point about commitment and responsibility. He says, if you want your life to feel meaningful, take responsibility. Wholeheartedly, you know, grab it, seize it, don't sort of blame someone else. Say, right, I'm going to do this. And he talks about commitment. You know, if you want to be good at something, you have to commit to it. If you refuse to commit to anything, you won't stick at anything, you'll never be good at anything. You know, you have to go for it, to do it properly. And if you don't do it properly, you'll find it boring, basically. <laughs> but it also won't be very fruitful. It won't accomplish much. So the way to achieve things in life is to go for it. To do it. But it's true, you might crash and burn. You might realise, actually, that wasn't a great idea. So, yeah, think about it beforehand. But in the end, you've just got to go for it. You've got to try. Because if you don't try, nothing's going to happen. 
And so Paul's making this general point about life, but also about God's blessing. And he's talking specifically here about their charitable giving. The whole issue he's, he's meandering about here is about how generous they're going to be in their giving. So when he's talking about reaping bountifully, he's saying somehow they will reap bountifully if they give generously. That's his point to them. He's somehow making the point that by their generosity they will not only demonstrate who they are, they will also be blessed. Somehow they will receive good things for the good things they give. And Jesus sort of underscores that. Fear not, little flock, he says. It's the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. I think the way he says it, fear not, little flock, is such an affectionate little term. Don't worry, little people. Don't worry, my little ones. Don't worry, my children. How many of people have worried? Everyone worries. <laughs> That's why he said it. He said, don't worry. Your father knows what you need. If we worry, it's as if we don't really trust our father. Our heavenly father. So do we trust him? And that's deep, basically what Jesus is confronting us with. Do we trust him? Do we really trust him? And he makes this profound point, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Because what we trust, and where we, if you like, lodge our hearts, are very closely related. You know, what do you really mean? What do you really trust? There's that phrase, you know, do you put your money where your mouth is? Where you actually invest is what you really believe in. Where you invest your time and your money, your effort, your emotions, you, that's a practical demonstration of what actually you really think is important. In other words, that's what you really believe in. So where does it go? Jesus is saying we should invest, if you like, in our Father in heaven. He says that's basically the best investment. That's the one that will actually give a guaranteed return. Because no stock market crash is going to take that out. No one's going to nick it off you. No one can possibly dispossess you from that. Nothing can destroy it. And if you invested in property in a certain time in China, then you might find it's all gone when the earthquake comes and all the buildings are flattened. If you invested in... My parents had the good fortune to own shares in Marconi and Northern Rock. <laughs> and all their investments were wiped out. Not that they were that great, to be honest, but the one of the ones they did have turned out to be utterly worthless. I mean, too bad. You know, it happens, doesn't it? But, so what do we invest in? Jesus says we should invest in, in heaven. For there, where our heart is, where our treasure is, our heart will be also. There, it's safe, if you like. If we've got to transfer our allegiance away from the things we can touch and we can feel to the things of heaven, we are actually ultimately safe because nothing can take that away. Nothing can dispossess us. We're actually safe, if you like, from ultimate injury because he will raise us up. It is actually the safest place to be if you really want peace of mind to invest in heaven. And then you can think, it's okay, it doesn't matter what happens now, it'll be all right. Father will look after me and I'll be fine. You'll be fine.